Hello everyone and welcome to a brand spanking new episode of the Studio Me cast. I am your host, Peter Regan, and today we're going to be talking to a special effects guest. That's right, we're going to be speaking with Jenna McCormick. She graduated from Tom Savini's special makeup effects program at the Douglas Education Center. Jenna McCormick's skill set includes, but is not limited to, traditional makeup artistry, special effects makeup, prop making, physical effects, sculpting, painting, and mold making. I gotta read this one out. She worked on Rookie Baby in Space, a documentary at the Aviary, The Young One 2, Moth Wings, Eyes That Say I Love You, How to Shake a Hand, The Pranked Crusader, and London Cubes Red and Black. She has an associate's in specialized business concentrating in special makeup effects and a bachelor's in business administration from UMASS. She was runner-up for Best Makeup at Pittsburgh's Film Festival and nominated for Best Makeup at Filmapalooza. She won the Douglas Education Spotlight Award and the Who's Who Award. She also won the 2020 Kendo Boston Eyeliner Competition. She currently works at a medical manufacturing company making hyper-realistic cadaver bodies for medical trainings and has a possible feature horror coming her way over the summer. Today's podcast is going to be focusing on how filmmakers can best work with special effects artists. Now, without any further ado, let me just transition. Please join me in welcoming Jenna McCormick. Jenna, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. First fun question, do you have a favorite special effect that you have seen in a film? Um, yes. My favorite effect from a film is um, the bladder effects that they do for the werewolf transformation and the howling. It has a really cool backstory. Um, I forget the name of the artist, but the artist who did the young werewolf in London, he was working on the howling first with his apprentice and then he got hired for werewolf in London. And he had to, he basically told his apprentice like, Hey, you need to keep this, but you can't do anything that I've shown you. So he had to come up with this bladdering effects, which is like, they do like compressed air to kind of bubble the skin during the transformation. I think it's really cool. That's awesome. When it comes to special effects, Do you find that most of the short films or features fall into the horror genre? Um, Yeah, I would say for the most part, they fall into more like horror or sci-fi genre. Do you think that filmmakers could probably think more about how to use the tool set or skill set of um, special effects practically like outside of horror? Um, I haven't thought too much about it, but I do. I think it's possible to kind of um, broaden the categories that they use special effects in. I know recently um, the film school that I went to, I went to school at um, Douglas Education Center and they have a film school and a special effects school. I didn't work the effects on this film, but they did more of a like drama film where there was like glass shattering and wounded hands and um, ripping out earrings and stuff like that. And it was, I think things like that could definitely add, like having a special effects artist would definitely add to those more theatrical dramatic films. What stage in a production is when someone should reach out to a special effects artist? Ideally, as soon as possible. Um, that way we have time to, you know, plan. Some of these effects take a very long time um, because you have to, sometimes you have to sculpt something and then mold it, cast it, test it out, um, try different techniques. So I'd say as soon as possible. And that way we can also get like a budget in place for for how we can go about um, certain things. Because like, for example, with uh, the Pranked Crusader, we had a fake hand. So we made our hand out of gelatin because it's much cheaper and we wanted to keep it um, as low budget as possible. But typically you might use like a silicone hand, which would be much more expensive. So when we did that film, uh, one of the things that I did was I had a meeting with you before the script was completely finalized because Mm -hmm. I I realized I hadn't done that much practical effects before. And I wanted to see if there were some opportunities for effects that 
maybe don't get as much play that special effects artists are like, ah, it would be great if we had the opportunity to use this or just, I knew that there was going to be some gore in it and mm-hmm. I wanted to get some collaboration, even like in the the writing process from you. Is that something that is typical, do you think, or should be done more? Or is it usually people come to you with a script and you just have to figure it out from there? Thus far, you're the only one who has really done that um, for me. At least I do. I did appreciate that. I did like that because um, after our conversation, you know, like the gears start turning and like, what else could we do? Like, oh, he said, do you want something super gory? Like two big, super gory things. Let's like, what What else can I do? How can I spray this blood sort of thing? Where um, most of the time it's like, hey, I need this, this and this. Go for it. I think the results spoke for themselves. Everybody sees the the part with the hand freaks out. Working with you on the Pranks Crusader was ma- much more oriented toward how can we work with uh, the makeup and special effects department. Um, the young one, too, was the complete opposite. We had a lot of faces of makeup, and in order to keep the continuity, we kept like having y'all do stuff and then bring them out and then we were shooting out of order so we kept saying like okay it needs to be like the third one you did but like a couple weeks have passed and uh i I, i'll say like it looked amazing uh you got nominated for it but i remember thinking like this has got to be uh extremely frustrating uh to work with (laughs) Um, it's like i just cleaned up this thing and you want me to do it again it's not easy i i that that's what i imagine would probably happen but that was the only way we could think to film it we based it around the location do you think that it would be helpful if filmmakers when they're or producers or 80s when they're getting a schedule together um spoke with the makeup or special effects makeup as like the like the department head for that to kind of keep that kind of thing in mind when scheduling stuff uh, just to kind of make sure that happens less because it's also time. It takes time to do what you do. Yeah, I definitely think so, especially with like the bloodier effects. If if we were going to be spraying blood that day, it would have been kind of a nightmare having to go back and forth because blood stains, it stains the skin, stains clothes. We'd have to, you know, have like 20 different outfits for him to change into. Um, and we'd have to like go back and like redo everything just to get them cleaned up. So I would say if you can keep it to like all the effects are in like the same, same time frame, that would be ideal. I understand though that it's not always going to happen. It's not always likely to happen either. I think that kind of explains one of the reasons why a lot of people don't do special effects uh, for a lot of their work. I mean, aside from the fact that it's a it's a heavily like skill oriented task to do, like you you have to know what you're doing for it, but it interacts so much with all the different aspects of production. Like if there is a fight that involves like uh, an effect, then well, you kind of got to get in with the fight choreography. My thought on that is it's the director's job to understand all the departments and make all those things work together. Are there any other departments that you find it really helpful to communicate or that you find yourself communicating with the most? Um, I find most of my communication is through the director or the AD. I do like to know like wardrobe, for example. I like to be in the loop with wardrobe. CGI, I haven't really communicated with like CG departments. Um, Usually when that's involved with my work, it's the director tells me either before or after the fact, like, hey, we're going to add CG to this. I do know when I was learning um, bullet hits, our teacher did tell us that a lot of times what we'll do to save time is we'll leave, like, say they got shot in the head, we'd leave the wound on their forehead. So when they're, the action of them getting shot, the wound is there and they'll just communicate with um cg or the director like hey why don't like you can just cover that with cg later because it'll take a lot more time for us to um place this wound after the fact perhaps like when you're at uh, tom savini's school do they talk about how to work with the other 
departments on a film shoot or is it very focused on what you're doing? How does that kind of, is that conversation even broached? Not at all. Um, my school didn't touch upon really any sort of like set etiquette or how to work in film. Um, all the practical effects that I've learned, I've had to seek my teachers out for them specifically. Like there was no class that went over it because that school was very much um, focusing on like the core skills that you'll need, not necessarily um, focused towards like a career in television or film. Are there standard techniques for different kills or? Um, yeah, there's definitely some like industry norms, I would say like for stabbing wounds, it's usually more mostly like camera angles. Every now and then they do something called an impalement belt, which is like a belt that the actor wears and the weapon slides in and out. So it looks like they're being impaled. Um, there's also compressed air, which is what we used for the fingers. That's usually used for like bullet hits. Um, that's on the newer side, I would say. They've been using squibs, like actual explosives um, to do bullet hits, but since it's it is pretty dangerous to and also time consuming to hook someone up to a squib they kind of have been moving over to more compressed air aside from going on sets and potentially making mistakes is there a way that like is there a resource for learning that kind of thing in your field yeah uh, my first set was um one of my teachers brought me on to it and I was able to kind of figure my way out by like following him, seeing what he was doing. And then the director of that set was also a part of the school. So he kind of was like, Hey, like, just so you know, like, this is how you do this. This is what we're doing here. Um, so that was how I figured it out. I don't know of any actual resources for artists who have no one to kind of guide them. Um, I would just say like, follow, follow your gut, uh, follow, like go with the flow sort of. Um, I typically, from what I've heard prior to going to school, it was like a makeup artist should not be seen or heard unless they are needed. So I try to kind of like stay back until I'm needed. Okay. So you don't have to name names. All right. And if you, uh, use me as an example for this, uh, definitely don't name names, but have there been any missteps or examples of like pitfalls that maybe directors fall into? Uh, I would say organization. I feel like a lot of times, um, it's not like full, like communication day of set isn't always the best, which can lead to like, you know, chaos, like, oh, I don't know when the actor needs to be done. I don't know what's going first, like what's going next. Oh, you're switching it. I didn't know that. Like just keeping us in the loop would be ideal. Um, I do have one film that I worked on. It was a student film. And I remember the director, I feel like he just didn't want to direct because it was a student film. So we had to, um, and he kind of let one of the actors kind of take over and the actor was just like total douche to all the makeup artists. And it was definitely an uncomfortable situation where we were like, okay, we want to leave as soon as possible. Can we wrap this up any faster sort of thing? So I would say also like making sure if you witness it, make sure like everyone's kind, not just the director. Communication organizing it sounds like pretty standard stuff but like the basics are often the hardest thing for people to commit to are there sort of like stages to developing this skill set yeah so i i started with like out of kit things which like you can youtube them it's like cotton and latex um things like that i would say you don't fully need like regular face makeup and to do special effects but i think it's a bonus I went into formal training for um, like traditional beauty makeups after I start, like after I knew that I really liked special effects and wanted to do that as a career. Um, for like effects though, I would say the main like building skill is sculpting. Sculpting and mold making would be like the top two skills that you need to really work on to improve all of your effects taking another turn with it's something that i found out when we were talking game prepped for this podcast 
I it just hadn't occurred to me is that you also will create super realistic human cadavers for medical schools, um, for practice. Um, that makes so much sense to me. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't think of that. So I, I have quite a bit of anatomy background from like, I have a bachelor's degree in business and I had to take anatomy classes as gen eds. And then I'm a yoga teacher as well. So I did anatomy classes for that. And then at school itself, um, makeup school, they did an anatomy class to help with our sculptures. Um, so that's like the background that I have, but you don't necessarily need an anatomy background for this because what they do is um, basically like they have designers who create this all in like a digital platform and they can 3D print certain things. And then we use the school, the skills that we learned at school to um, mold make and then cast in like a more fleshy material. Um, I got into it because I knew, I know that I want to do shop work um, as a career and I would like to ideally shop work for film, but fresh out of school, I don't have any experience. So I came down here to do, um, it's the same skill sets. It's just a different uh, industry. The fact that you have that background in anatomy obviously informs that, but just affect all of your special effects stuff do you ever have this inner monologue of like making something exciting for a movie versus what you know is actually realistic for what a particular action would look like um is that ever something that you consider while you're working on something oh yeah definitely i feel like the more realistic and the closer to it being anatomically correct the more realistic the shot looks the more realistic the effect will look um so yeah it's definitely something that i keep in mind during every every sculpt that i do for films is there any kind of uh, a joy that you get by seeing something that's unrealistic but cinematic like the squibs in Django? yeah i mean i uh, i definitely love seeing things like that like um i think it's a film called the censors i'm not positive though they do like this really cool head explosion effect and it like the head just like blows up like a balloon and it, it's so cool but the, that's like all explosives have you ever had a chance to work with explosives before no not yet um two of my teachers were really into pyrotechnics and um they did a lot of it one of them did end up um actually they both neither of them do pyrotechnics anymore but I know there was some sort of like close call accident that made them kind of fade away from doing um, pyrotechnics. So something I, I think I'd enjoy, but it's definitely, I feel like the industry is starting to move away from them. When you like see a, a real injury somewhere, or if you've come across something like that, I don't like been by a car accident uh, or looking at something for reference, is that uh, something that has almost been desensitized to you or is that something that you like, do you go like, Oh yeah, here's how I would do that. No, when I know something is real, it definitely still freaks me out looking at it. Um, especially like burns and things like that freak me out. As soon as like, if someone told me it was an effect though, I'd be like, totally fine. It's funny. I don't know why. I react like that, <laughs> but I still, I do have to look up, um, different injuries and stuff, especially for work, uh, to make the most realistic wounds possible. But you have to go through and look at this stuff. Does that have like an effect on, I guess, mental health? Is there anything you have to do to like protect yourself or like guard yourself from that or like come out of that? Like, can you tell us the difficult side of that research? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely can affect. I find that it's more like anxiety producing for me. Um, I do try to stick to like more the medical side of things. So I'll try and find... Um, like a medical research that's doing like say if I have to make a burn I'm looking at like medical research about burns and um, that feels a little bit better to me than um, looking at traumas of 
strangers on the internet. Um, I, at work, they give us specific reference photos. So like, I'm not allowed to go look up my own like burn photos. They would give me exactly how they want the burn to look. And that's very like close up just of the wound. I think I like that better too, where I don't see like the whole person. I just see the part that I need to see. What you're doing is helping people with training, which ultimately is saving and bettering other people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would imagine that you would find a lot of fulfillment from that. And uh, in the same way that you brought, I hope <laughs> you find fulfillment like working on films. Can you talk about like satisfaction with your work in both of those or if you are ever satisfied with um how you produce stuff yeah well so at work um i work for a branch of the company that does new to market products so it's a lot of prototyping and a lot of failure so i do tend to find when i'm towards the end of a project especially a long project that's been failing and it finally succeeds like that is just like a like a yes like i'm so happy to have that done with and then i know it goes off and it does um a lot of good for uh different areas of the country um working in films i get super excited with specifically physical effects um like the video I sent you, the test video of the hand, the fingers being blown off. Shortly after that video, all three of us who were in my kitchen that night were just like, oh my God, we did it. Like we were so like, so excited about that. And um, so like figuring things out, cause I feel like a lot of practical effects is like engineering and figuring out like a puzzle basically of like, how are we gonna do this? And how are we gonna make it look real? And when it finally clicks into place, it's just like such a satisfying like, Yes. Let's go all like celebrate. <laughs> I was freaking out too when I saw it. <laughs> it's like I can't believe this looks this good. Even and you were using water too, but I could tell I'm like, wow, this is gonna be amazing. Uh did you like can how many hours went into that effect? Um, so that one we it was kind of a struggle at first because we, we've never done anything like that. Most, um, cause we, what we did is we looked up a lot of films that had finger cutting scenes and pretty much all of them that we could find were like the hand is on a solid surface and then it gets cut. So like you could easily just put a fake hand and cut it with a real knife. It wouldn't be um, difficult to do. But since his was going to be aerial, we need to figure out how to push the fingers off. Um, I'd say hours wise, it was probably, I know it was that full day, probably about 18 hours that day of just testing it out. And then I want to say like another five, five to eight hours the day before of prep work, making like all the gelatin hands and getting like the tubing sorted out. That was well, that's awesome to hear. And one of the things that you also brought onto that production um, was a team as well that you could rely on, which is something that was really amazing to me is we had had our meeting. And then the next time I heard from you, you basically said, OK, so I've got like six people. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, cool. You know, I'll just we'll get more pizza. <laughs> and um, the. Uh, and having that entire team and then also seeing the effect when it was being done, how it took a few people to like really make it work where it's like where it's resetting it, like working with the valve and all that for the air pressure and just dressing it and like giving it a final look and everything. Two. Do you have advice for filmmakers with special effects, something that will help the end result? Um, I would say be as flexible as possible. A lot of effects need to be shot a certain way. And I find it's almost always kind of awkward to be the makeup artist and be like, hey, you got to shoot my effect from this angle. Because it's like I, like, I don't know film the best, but I do know 
this effect will not look real if you shoot it from like the opposite side. So just like being flexible with the shots, being flexible with how the effect looks, um, that is ideal when working with filmmakers. Be flexible, communication, and organization. Yes. Timeless advice uh, from Jenna McCormick. So, Jenna, I th I thank you very much for being on this podcast. It's been really great collaborating with you. I look forward to doing it again someday. And I hope that you get um, to be involved with the, the feature films coming up. Uh, hopefully, you know, maybe more news on that. Thank you very much, Jenna, for being on the show. Thank you for having me.